Have you ever had a relationship that has effectively totally broken down? It could be for a variety of reasons. It, it could just be drifting apart, or, or it could have been something that you or, or they did. Longing to get back together, to, to have peace and for that to be restored. Well, that's the case of, for God's people here in Exodus 32. Uh, they'll get to the point where they're longing for that relationship to be restored because they are no longer at peace. Why? Because, as Exodus 32 shows us, they fail to worship him as they ought to do. Instead, they bow down to a golden calf. It's a story that's known to many. And so let's just think about it for, for a few moments and think, why was it that they ended up doing this? What well, we see it in verse 1, when the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain. Uh, then at the end of verse 1, uh, they say, as for this fellow Moses, that we don't know what's happened to him. Moses is a long time. They don't know what's happened. And they're afraid. So they mob Aaron to find them somebody else. It's a lesson they should have learned by now, though. To trust God. Uh, you know, at the Red Sea, what did they do? Well, they panicked. Uh, what did they do when they ran out of food and water? They panicked. Uh, when the Amalekite army came, they panicked. And yet God provided each and every time. They just needed to trust and to be patient. Yet as I say that about them, I think of myself and I think I, I should learn that lesson too. God can be so generous and kind, provide so much, uh, show incredible love towards me, and yet how quickly, as soon as some difficulty comes along, I can throw my arms up in the air and go, oh, where is God in this? And I know I'm not alone in doing that. And it reminds me that, that I need to trust God. He has shown so much evidence of his faithfulness and goodness. I just need to trust him and recognise that he's not necessarily working in my way, because his is better, or in my time, because again, his timing is better. Well, the description of the sin is, of course, they make this golden calf. Now, I don't think it's a denial, that, I don't think they're denying that God is their rescuer. What do they want? They want one who's going to mediate for them, like Moses had done. So how do they do that? Well, a golden calf. But before we get too critical and think, gosh, how primitive and stupid are they? Actually, it doesn't look that bad to begin with. Because it starts with a gold gift offering. I mean, incredibly generous gifts. And they announce a festival to the Lord, which uh, in chapters 4 to 7 uh, was going to be the great aim of um, being set free to have a festival to the Lord. And they get up early, which shows significant devotion. They offer burnt offerings and, and fellowship offerings. This looks incredibly religious. And then Aaron says, verse 4, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I mean, they aren't stupid. They know that this golden cow isn't the thing that rescued them, but it's a symbol to help them remember the God that did. So actually, it, maybe it's not as bad as we first thought. It's helping to remember God. They're, they're being very religious in the way they worship. Where's the harm? Well, clearly there is harm because God really hates it, and we'll see that in a moment. But what is the problem? Well, it's a breach of commandment too, particularly about making idols. But why is that such a problem? It is because, I suppose, this is an earthly representation of, of what God is like. It's saying God is like this. Now, bulls, calves, uh, they symbolise great power and strength, uh, particularly in a place like Egypt. Uh, their gods were of power and strength, and it, it was important in cosmology. It was a very pagan symbol for power and strength of God. And of course, when you're alone, in a desert, and afraid, that is exactly what you want. But here's the problem. God is not a cow. God is so much more than that. You see, God had defeated all of the gods of Egypt. And they're turning back to a false, defeated gods of paganism. God might have power, but that's not all he is. He's also a God of faithfulness, of love and mercy. And it's a good job he is, because otherwise they're going to get wiped out. And that isn't symbolised by a cow. 
But actually, what do they need? They, they needed instead Aaron to remind them who God was. Exodus 1 to 30 are chapters full of the character and nature of God. It's about a God who sees, who hears, who knows, and sends someone to rescue them. It's about a God who sees um, and does great works of power to rescue them from the Egyptians. He's provided food for them. He's given them a tabernacle, which is what chapters 24 and 31 are all about, so that he can be with them. They've seen all of that. They've seen his trustworthiness, his reliability, his power, his generosity, his kindness. And they reject it. They rebel against him and reject it. It's a total denial of what God is like. And the result of their false view of God, their false worship of that God, is revelry and riot. Verse 6, they get up, present these offerings, and then they eat, drink, and get up to indulge in revelry. Or in verse 25, it looks very much like a riot. And I say that when you have a wrong view of God, you worship him the wrong way, and it quickly becomes increasingly vulgar to him. And so it is a drunken orgy at the end of this. But of course, what do we expect? You see, how you think about God does affect how you live and therefore worship. And in turn, how you live and worship affects how you think. You see, they get who God is wrong, which means they end up getting the how to worship him wrong. And the result is godless lives. Uh, the pagan representation that, that says that God is only about power results in a pagan worship and sex unfaithfulness and total lack of self-control. But the sin of the calf is so very easily ours. And by ours, I'm not saying ours as a nation, because of course this is the people of God who do this, and therefore this is seen in the church today. And we need to be wary of it. That actually as God's people, as the church today, we can so easily pick up this sin of the cow. How? Because we end up with a false view of God. And a false view of God leads to a life that is not honouring to God. It does not worship him as we ought. How we think about God affects the way we live. I'll give three examples. And let me be clear, no one believes these things truly. But we all have aspects of them at different times. So, for example, we, we can consider God to be distant and removed. And in some respects, like Israel, away and, and therefore not help. And so the result is, is that not all of life will end up being about worshipping God. Because we need to determine our own lives, because he's too far away, that we become semi-gods. And therefore our lives become characterised by fear and worry because we've got to try and control it all. And where we can't, we despair. That's if we think that God is far away. The result is, I suppose, that we can, in order to control things, we therefore hoard things, we become materialists, would be one way in which we express it, because it's all about making sure that we can cover everything and care for everything. You see, what we view of God affects how we live. Or we view God as a judge. You know, the sort of the uh, only there to catch you out sort of thing. He's like the deputy head that I had at school. Mr Hartley, lovely man really, but he was always around the corner just when you didn't need him to be. So the motivation of serving God is fear, not love. So you don't want a relationship with him. And you serve hard in order to justify yourself, to satisfy God. And so we end up becoming self-righteous. We don't do things for the sake of others, but actually to please ourselves and, and, and to hopefully please God. And then we often see it that when the way in which we thought we were serving God gets taken away, we can get very angry or, or very nervous. Because actually that was the thing that was giving us our identity, our purpose, our value, our justification before God. That's if we view God as a judge, just a judge. 
But the other end of the spectrum, I suppose, is when we think that God is there really kind of as a nice friend, as sort of a, more of a therapist, someone to chat to and just help me feel a bit better. So he's there to satisfy me, which removes the fact that he is king and lord. And so my ethic becomes, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody, then it's all okay. And if it does hurt somebody or it does hurt me, it must be stopped. So relationships end up being based on how I feel and mutual consent, not on what God says is best. So if I consider something not to be what I want, then I don't have to listen. Which means actually God's word is going to end up being quite uncomfortable for us. So we'll say it's outdated. It becomes irrelevant because God doesn't know what 21st century Britain's like. He can't possibly have meant it because he must want me to be happy, nice uh, and feel great. And so all of us step aside from the teaching of Jesus that says that actually we need to take up our cross and follow him. That the Christian life is, is one of sacrifice. And just as what they needed was not to go uh, finding some other God to worship or, or, or finding some uh, picture or caricature of God, they need to be reminded who God really was. And that's all we need to do too, to find God in his word. So the sin was that they made God an image in their own mind, thinking of him in a way other than he truly was, and therefore by worshipping him in a different way too. So is there any hope? Well, we will see that God shows mercy to them and shows mercy to us. But in the meantime, we're going to just spend a few moments reflecting. As we listen to the song, our sins, they are many, but his mercy is more. So Israel have sinned and they have sinned badly, haven't they? Well, what is the result of this rebellion and rejection? Well, we see God's anger. Verse 10, now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them, that I may destroy them, and then I will make you a great nation. God says it's time to start again, and it is deserved. And it produces Moses with an incredible opportunity that he could be the great nation. And yet Moses isn't concerned in the slightest about that. Uh, not a bit. Instead, he's concerned supremely for God's glory, for God's honour and reputation. And so what Moses does is in order to preserve God's glory, he, he, he uh, does three things. He intercedes for the people. Uh, he disciplines the people that God's glory might uh, be maintained and honoured. And then he seeks atonement that he may be glorified as his people are once again restored with God. So how does he intercede? Verses 11 and to 14. Well, there's something here for us. He doesn't intercede by sweeping under the carpet or excusing their sin. No, he appeals to God's own reputation. Uh, verse 11, why is it that uh, these Egyptians should say, verse 12, that it was with evil intent that he brought them out? Turn from your fierce anger. He doesn't want the Egyptians and others looking on to go, oh, God is evil. No, he can't afford to wipe them out. Uh, but secondly, uh, he, he's concerned for God's glory and, and says, look, you are most glorious when you are faithful. So verses 13 to 14, he says, remember your servants Abraham, Isaac and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self. Uh, that is, uh, this phrase, swore by your own self, takes us back to Genesis 15, where God promises on oath to fulfill his promises to Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob. It's an odd ceremony where animals are cut in half, put either side of a path, and God walks through the middle. As if to say, if I break my promise, which we know he won't, then you can tear me apart from limb from limb. The covenant is all of God's work and he will keep it. And Moses knows that God cannot destroy his people because of the promise he made. Because he's always trustworthy and faithful. That is why he's so glorious. And see how different Moses' response, therefore, is to Israel. Israel are worried and afraid. They wonder where Moses is, so they make stuff up about God. But what does Moses do? He remembers how glorious God is, his faithfulness. And that is what gives Moses great confidence to speak and speak to God in the way that he does to intercede for them. 
Now, where we see the church go astray, on what basis is it that we appeal to God? What is my motivation? Is it for the survival of my denomination? Is it for uh, the, uh, that or all for the glory of God? Is it about the survival of buildings and our position as the state church or the glory of God? Is it about uh, the survival of our position within society or the glory of God? What God has promised is that his glory will be seen as he builds his church but he hasn't promised necessarily to build the Church of England. We must pray for the Church of England. We must pray for the Church in England. But supremely we must pray for the glory of God to be known in the world. Because God will keep his promise and he will build his church. So let us pray that God will build his church in the world. But God is also most glorious when we see uh, the discipline. The discipline that Moses, uh, uh, the uh, interceder, uh, the leader, the mediator, uh, does. He comes down from the mountain having appealed for mercy. He then gets angry. Angry with the people. And I hope you see those two side by side. Mercy and wrath. Discipline is those two things. It, Moses can't come down the mountain and not care how they've just behaved. So he takes the calf, he grinds it down, he makes the people drink the, the dust of gold. It's a symbolic thing of total destruction, annihilation of the idol, teaching something very important. And yet, and given this must have taken some time, there is still revelry going on in the camp. And so a judgment must be delivered. The Levites come to his side and 3,000 are killed because they refuse to repent. Moses interceded, asking them to repent. But still, there were some who were unrepentant, and so the judgment came. Now, where we feel this is a bit over the top, I just wonder whether we've made an idol of God in our minds. It's to say that sin isn't really a problem, that maybe God is uh, not justly angry at our sin, and that actually he's over the top in his reaction here. Well, that's to say that God isn't bothered by holiness. No, so what we need to remember is that the wages of sin is death. And the people of Israel collect their wages. What's staggering is that 99.85% of them don't. So you know, Moses, concerned for God's glory, uh, he intercedes for them. Uh, but then he uh, brings about discipline to teach them. And then finally, uh, God's glory is seen uh, as he seeks to make atonement for the people of of God. Verse 30, Moses says to the people, you've committed a great sin, but now I'll go up to the Lord and perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. He wants them to be at one, at one month again. Because sin is not just an arbitrary making of some rules. Uh, we see in, in verses 15 and 16 stresses how many times that it's God who wrote the, uh, the law with his finger. It's an expression of who he is, and they just smash it up and tear it apart. Now just think of a child who spends hours on a painting and gives it to you, and you just rip it up. There would be a broken relationship, and there is a broken relationship between God and his people. They need to be brought back to God, and Moses knows that, and he offers to be uh, the, the mediator. He offers to, to make atonement. Now, of course, Moses in chapters 24 to 31 has been told all about the sacrificial system. But there's a hint here that Moses knows that that wouldn't be sufficient. Because in verse 32 he says, Now forgive their sin, but if not, then blot me out from the book that you have written. Here Moses offers himself in the place of God's people. They have rejected him, and yet he was willing to give his life for theirs. Now you'll see in verse 35 that God does not accept that offer. Because as we know, Moses is not able to. He might be willing, but is unable. But it does point us to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is not only willing, but also able. You see, for the sin that we have committed, where we have rejected him, where we have worshipped other gods, so Jesus offers to stand in our place. You see, he seeks God's glory as he says, yet not my will, but your will be done. He prays for the people of God, O oh, Jerusalem, how I've longed to gather to you. 
He would uh, discipline the people by bringing warnings of judgment on their religious system of his day. And supremely, his glory is as he's lifted up. Lifted up on the cross to take the curse of sin on himself. He would stand in my place and your place so that we can be forgiven and go free. Yes, 1 Corinthians 10 tells us that these things are written as a warning to us, not to be proud and think that we couldn't possibly ever be like this. Yet Romans 8 tells us this. Who then is the one that condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, was then raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is interceding for us. Where we have sinned individually, where we have sinned as the people of God, so we have the Lord Jesus Christ, who intercedes for us, who disciplines us, and who supreme on the cross makes atonement for us. That we need no longer be at war with God, be enemies with God, but might have peace with God. Brothers and sisters, keep yourselves from idols. But we have one who intercedes for us, one who has mediated on our behalf to bring atonement that we might be at peace with God. We're going to reflect on that as we sing together uh, the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us, took the blame, bore the wrath. We stand forgiven at the cross.